Welcome to the R7 Podcast, sponsored by M is Good. R7 is an innovative, God-inspiring process that explores personal and professional purpose. R7 analyzes seven strategies to transform your vision and find direction in your organizational marketing. R7 establishes clarity and guidance for the gift we call life. My Welcome to the R7 podcast. Just like always, I am super pumped this week because I have a longtime friend, brother in Christ, Steve Noble with me. Today we're going to be talking about action. And I'm so excited to bring in Steve to the podcast because he's been a warrior, man. He's been out there, oh gosh, just kicking butt, taking names for. 15 plus years. The first time I saw you, I'll never forget. We were at a golf course, country club, and you're just out there, just a sea of people. And like, you're just kicking butt, man. Like, you're just spitting truth, and people are like clapping and, yeah, Steve. And, you know, they're <laughs> saying, they're saying everything that you want to say, but you're like afraid to say it. And you're yes. just, oh, oh my God, that was a call to action. <laughs> Gosh, you're just, just awesome. So, speaking of action. On, yeah. Watching that intro to the podcast, I'm like, who's that clean shaven dude? <laughs> <laughs> like your face is missing that action. You actually look better with facial hair. So, Thank or, you. To, or to quote David, uh, you look amazing. <laughs> there you go. Always. Always. <laughs> it's great to be here. <sighs> We're glad to have you back. I mean, we had you in a different iteration of our experience podcast a few years ago. And now, man, mm -hmm. so many things have changed for you. Um, you know, for us. And so, you know, when, when Jones was like, Hey, I want to bring Steve Noble back. I was like, that's great. Cause the first time we had you on was really awesome to begin to understand kind of your journey to what got you to where you were. And now your journey, to what you're doing now is awesome, man. Yeah. It's just, uh, ch -ch 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 changes a little David Bowie action, which is way, the way my life has been really <laughs> my whole life. I, you know, there's so many people like here in Raleigh, North Carolina, and like all my students, and I, and we might touch on that today. It's it's amazing how many of my students have only lived in one state. I've lived in eight, and it's mm. amazing how many of my students have never traveled past the Mississippi. So most people tend to stay put. As a matter of fact, a few years ago, this was because of doing radio. I'm such a numbers person, grabbing data and stuff all the time. Seventy five percent of American adults will live within a hundred miles of where they graduated from high school which is crazy to me. I can't even imagine that. But yeah, ch -ch -ch change, man. I'm all about it. Yeah. So like when I think about the ministry and M is good and, you know, just working with Christian organizations out there, like you are on the, you've been consistently, whether you are in your painting business, whether you're doing radio, like you are consistently on the front lines, just kicking butt, man. Like you are an apologetics like super Nova AI type guy, just know everything about the gospel. Like you have questions about the gospel. I'll talk to Steve Noble, and you know. So, man, just tell us, give us a, give us a, uh, just the last couple of years, what's been happening in your life, and kind of what's at the center of yeah this idea of glorifying the Lord with your talents and your abilities. This is a, a little freaky on the timing here. What's today, March eighteenth, uh, on April sixth, coming up in what three weeks? That will be the 20th anniversary of when I left my self-obsessed life behind. That's the day that Call to Action got started at a Raleigh City Council meeting. That would be 20 years ago on April 6th. And, uh, you know, and, that, and that's when I still had my house painting company and, and just a small business guy. We, I, I, I've always had, at least as an adult, a healthy disdain for our government. And so when we moved to Raleigh in 1997 and we were baby Christians, we became Christians in uh, 94, married in 92, saved in 94, moved here in January in 97. Uh, and that's why I thought that was one of the joys of owning a small business is just try to avoid uh, the tax man and, and uh, the government as much as possible, have as much freedom as possible. And why we homeschool. Uh, we just didn't want to play by the culture's rules. And so we kind of distance ourselves from the culture. And then Call to Action started in 2004, and that was uh, just, uh, I wasn't looking for anything that kind of came after me and, and just showed up and got involved and had 300 plus people at the Raleigh City Council meeting. Yeah. That's when I met Bishop Wooden the same day, uh, and, and it just kind of went from there. So it was house painting and activism, 
from 2004 till, 2000, till May of 2011, when God sold my house painting business almost out from underneath me. Radio started in 2007, so call to action 2004, radio 2007, God sells the house painting company in May of 2011. Uh, and then the, by the end of that year, added in working with Greg Laurie and the Harvest Crusades all over the country. I did that through uh, October of 2016. And then I was back to just radio only at that point. <clears throat> but starting in 2012, I started teaching high school age students here locally in Raleigh. That wasn't my idea. Radio wasn't my idea. All these things God just kind of orchestrated. But uh, 2011, somewhere in there, my wife, Gina, and one other homeschool mom were like, hey, with all your government stuff, and we've seen you work with uh, young people, you should probably be teaching a class on uh, government for high school students. And we had two of those at the time. Our two oldest kids, I'm like, Ugh, okay, fine, I'll do it. And, and that's one of the lessons I've learned is uh, you got to know the power of no. You can't say yes to everything, but you should probably say yes to a lot more than you do regularly. And then you get yourself out there and you never know what the Lord's going to do with it. But unless you throw some bait in the, in the pond, you're never going to catch anything. And so I started teaching in 2012, the fall of 2012, which just kept growing. And uh, this year I've got about 260 students uh, at Noble U, which you guys mentioned earlier. And so radio, my last radio show after 16 years and 3,400 live radio shows was Friday, December 22nd, uh, because it really came down to uh, with all these students and teaching eight classes every week, plus all four subjects online and radio five days a week from four to 5 p.m. That's a lot. And I, and I and I came to the realization that I don't think I can do both with excellence. So something has to drop. Something's got to give <clears throat> my heart. I knew I wanted to focus on teaching and reaching the next generation as opposed to preach into the choir. But I took that to Gina and took it to friends and took it to my board and said, OK, you got to pick, you know, my gifting. Uh, one or the other. Either you want me preaching to the choir or going after the next generation, and they all said, go after them. So that's uh, that's the most recent trans uh, transition, so to speak, in uh, my life. That's awesome, man. That's a serious journey for sure, and I think teaching government is a big deal, especially today. So as you're doing that, you know, as you're teaching students about and a government and how our country works. What are some of the big misconceptions you're finding that our students just don't understand? Great question. Great question. <laughs> the, 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 I wish they had enough information to have some misconceptions. <laughs> <clears throat> wow. that, that's the reality of it. They're massively ignorant. I just uh, was at a homeschool convention speaking a couple of times down in South Carolina. And the name of one of my talks was uh, Civic Stupidity Engaging the Ignorance of a Nation. The biggest problem we have, whether you're talking about 55-year-olds or 15-year-olds, is ignorance. They just don't understand how the government was designed to operate. They know almost nothing about the Constitution. They know almost nothing about their own rights. And I tell my students all the time, if you don't know your rights, effectively you don't have any because you don't know when they're going to be when they're being trampled on or taken away from you or diffused in some way. So there's just massive ignorance. They just don't know much at all. They figure they don't need to know anything until they're adults. And so you have that hill to get over pretty early on. Uh, but th I've chosen these. That one I didn't choose. That was my wife's idea and another homeschool mom's idea. But after that, I added Christian ethics, which is what I got my master's degree in, ethics, theology, and culture six years ago. Three years ago, I added U.S. history because that's obviously a hot-button topic, uh, which obviously has been hijacked on the left. But the right struggles with that in some other ways. And that's a great cultural engagement. All these things that I teach and then added world history this year all allow you to get a good education in terms of the subject matter itself. But these are also topics that allow you to engage the culture around you, where most people are ignorant. So I tell my students, hey, especially in civics, to your question, David. I'll, I'll teach them something and I'll go there. Once again, you're now 90, you're, you're now smarter than 95% of your fellow citizens. I mean, and I mean nationwide, because most people don't understand the basics of, uh, of, of a representative republic, which is what we live in rather than a democracy. So it's just a matter of getting them up to speed. And then you got to show them, why does this matter? Why does U.S. history matter? Why does world history matter? Well, why does government matter? Well, I'll, I'm going to make it painfully obvious as to why this matters, because we're selling your future down the road, down the river. We're $34.5 trillion in debt right now. We'll be $150 trillion in debt in about 35 years with unfunded liabilities. And, and I tell my students, we're taking out credit card after credit card after credit card in your name. Yep. 
and I'll be dead and enjoying heaven and it's all going to fall on your head. And then they're all like, <laughs> so you got to wake them up and then they understand, oh yeah, this is important. Right. And then good luck getting it back from the Chinese banks who are just sitting there licking their chops <laughs> as every day goes by and they count their interest. <laughs> yes, indeed. It's kind of, <laughs> it is. And I, and, and, and I love what you said there because I was curious to see if you were going to say, say what I thought you might say. And you did is I think one of the biggest misconceptions, and I don't care what news outlet you listen to, it doesn't matter, is that when you think about the Constitution, you think about our government, the biggest gap is believing that we are this full democracy, which would have equaled anarchy and fascism, versus understanding we are a constitutional representative republic. There's a huge difference there. And the problem is you've got our kids don't understand it. Their parents don't get it either. You know, and the grandparents are like, I'm just tired. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah, yeah. Come, Lord Jesus, get me out of here. This place exactly. is a train wreck. Right. Exactly. Well, with exactly. my students, they, this is funny. I do this to them every year. Uh, and now I do it across multiple classes, uh, subjects. I'm like, let me teach you why you don't want to live in a democracy. Yeah, right. And then I'll I'll, I'll look at one kid in our class, in the class. Let's say there's 30 kids in there. I said, okay, here, here, here's my proposal. Let's take a vote. Uh, Let's cut class right now. Let's go down the street to Starbucks or wherever. You can buy whatever you want, as much of it as you want. And Jimmy over there is going to pay for it. <clears throat> let's vote. How many of you are vote? Yes, let's go do that. And then everybody's hand goes up. And then there's poor Jimmy over in the corner and two other kids that have a heart. And so they're like, no, that would be unfair. But the <laughs> overwhelming majority, 90% of them say, yeah, let's go. And I say, yep. that's exactly why you don't want to live in a democracy, because it's majority rule. And when the majority rules, there's no consideration for the minority. So we just completely hosed little Jimmy. And yep. all of you guys are smiling while you do it. Yep. And I'm like, that's why you don't want to live in a democracy. Then they're like, oh, OK, you got to take this stuff and bring it into a teenager's world and apply it in their world. Then the eyes open, the scales fall off and understanding begins to happen. Yeah, it's Lord of the Flies all over again. <laughs> you know, that's really what it is. <laughs> to a certain extent, that's exactly right. Uh, you know, Just move exactly. to Somalia. You'll see how it works <laughs> without a government. It's funny because I had a coworker about six months ago that my company had hired, and he immigrated to the United States from Ethiopia. And I was at lunch with him, and he goes, yeah. He's like, next week, I'm going to have my full citizenship. And I'm like, you're taking the test? He's like, yeah. And I sat there and I was like, how fascinating would it be? I was like to rig this deal where I play this game. I'm like with you, his name is Z with Z versus I'll just randomly pick four people all over our company to have, you know, a history test with, and we'll see who does better. And he looked <laughs> at me and he's like, Oh, I know a lot. I'm like, I know you do because that test is tough. Yeah. Well, they have you to know? study a hundred different questions. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so for what it's worth what it's worth. Dave Jones. I want to take this conversation a little bit of a different direction because I've really been praying about having you on Steve. And, you know, um, I really also been praying about this idea of, you know, action. And when we have Christian business owners, organizational leaders that come in and we go through the messaging, the destiny, the messaging, the, the vision, the communication brand really haven't done a podcast on action. And when I think about you, and, and I could be totally wrong, but you know, you feel free to jump in. I think we're on a, you know, we have an awesome friendship. But when I think about you and this idea of the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain, you know, I look at, you know, just being average in the world of whether it's career, mental, emotional, physical, spiritual. And I think about this idea of avoidance of pain and the pursuit of pleasure. And I, and I think there's something in your brain that says this is going to be not fun, but challenging enough to be pleasurable for, your, for, you, for you to pursue it. Whereas somebody would say, that's just too much work, man. I have to go relearn something. I'm, I mean, you've taken on three really significant industries here. And, uh, and you're kicking butt at them and you're, you know, you're, you're doing so well at it. And I just think there's a shift in your brain more than any other person that I've seen that says, I'm going to go tackle this. This is going to be a challenge. This is where God's got me. I mean, there was a time where didn't you like, I, I remember this, this was many years ago. 
Didn't you like sell your house and get completely out of debt and downsize? We did the Dave Ramsey thing. Yeah, we sold our house, which is a house we built in North Raleigh, which was a nice house. And we (laughs) sold it. And then we, for 13 months, we rented a house in Wake Forest. And then we bought the last house we lived in, which was about half the size of that house. And we're all rammed in there and our four kids, two girls share a bedroom, two boys share a bedroom. We're literally across this tiny little hall from them. And, uh, I tell you, in the American context, yeah. when people would say, oh, so we tell people uh, we're selling our house. What What's the assumption in the American context? The assumption is you're moving on up, baby. It's, yeah. it's like the Jeffersons. We're moving on up. Doo, doo, doo. And, and, and we had to spit it out so fast. I had to say, uh, actually, we're renting. And then as soon as you say that, people are like, oh, something really bad happened. Because... To all of a sudden go from owning a house to renting a house obviously means there's something wrong. And and in the American context, we're so afraid. That's that pain pleasure thing. You're so afraid of people's reactions. So I found myself having to say, uh, we're renting. And then, because I I love the uncomfortable moments. And they're like, they don't know what to say. And I say, we're actually trying to get out from underneath the mountain of debt. We're doing the Dave Ramsey thing. We're just trying to scale back and get our finances under control. So we're going to rent for 13 months until we find a house that we, that we should have lived in originally that we didn't, we built a house that we didn't need to live in. And now we're rearranging, but that willingness to kind of jump off and go through something that uh, is, could appear to be uh, embarrassing. And uh, it's revealing because you're, when you tell people that it just reveals that you were making some bad decisions financially and so I, I just for for the for the longest time, certainly longer than you've even known me, Dave. I'm I'm yeah. not a great respecter of people, meaning I don't really care about your opinion. Now, as a Christian, I'm called to be above reproach, so it's not like I can ignore everybody around me. I I need wisdom from other people. I need to be checked and challenged, uh, but I'm not going to make my decisions based on whether you and and either one of you agrees with me, whether it's David or Dave. I'm I'm not going to. Well, what are they going to think of me? <clears throat> no, uh, there, there's what my wife thinks of me. There's what my four kids think of me. And then there's ultimately what the Lord thinks of me. And that's about it. So I don't, I don't make decisions or make moves or change my life based on the opinions of others. And so that, that's just been a big part of it for a while. And I think that's beautiful. And I think if you like what you just said there, I love the uncomfortable moments. Mm-hmm. Like I, that's the pursuit of that pleasure where people would say that's too painful man like i can't i have too much pride ego whatever it is to go do that i'm just gonna grind through and pretend like everything's okay but you you attack this stuff man like it's it's so encouraging to me um that you do this and you do it often well the you know when god says i'll never leave you nor forsake you he didn't wink uh, he he won't ever leave you and he yep. won't ever forsake you. And so That's God right. is on the other side of every decision I've ever made. He's already there. And so if I if I sell the painting company and and that screws up and now we knew we listen, when we sold the painting business and on May 30th was when we signed it over and, and got the check. And I sold a house painting company. I didn't sell red hat. So we weren't <laughs> retiring. We we had literally had till the end of the year to use that money to, to, to pay off the car, whatever. Of course you have to go to Disney and then, <laughs> and then, but we're like, by January 1st, we're screwed by January 1st. We have a $2,500 a month hole in our budget and God's going to have to provide. And I don't, a bunch of things I tried to do. I tried to sell the business before I couldn't, I tried to do this. I tried to do that. It didn't happen. So then I'm like, okay, I don't know what's going on here. And then, and then God gets me back on the radio to a daily platform. And then literally within months, sells my business out from underneath me. And I'm like, uh, well, Gina, I mean, I didn't orchestrate this. I'm a type A guy. I didn't make this happen. God uh, uh, sure looks like he's moving. So we're just going to have to trust him. And what's that going to look like? And all I, all I know is I need another job by the end of the year. And I don't know what that's going to look like. And we're literally <laughs> in Disney in October and uh, late October. And we're on the ferry coming back from the Magic Kingdom to the parking lot going across the water. And my phone rings. And this is how uh, you and I first got involved doing some stuff together, Dave. Uh, it was John Collins at the Harvest Crusades, who was the number two guy with Greg Laurie. And we had done a crusade here in 07. You remember that? Yeah. 
And so in, in uh, 2000, late 2011, they're like, hey, we want to do this Harvest America thing. We want to take the uh, crusade, like a Billy Graham crusade, for those of you that don't know what that is, and and do a local crusade, California, wherever. But we want to simulcast it, and we want to put it into churches and stuff. And, and, and you're so well connected in North Carolina. We would like you to kind of work on that next year. You would start in January. And, uh, and you have a little bit of travel and, uh, we'll, we'll start you off. We'll just pay as a consultant. We'll start you off at 2,500 bucks a month to help us out with that, which was the exact hole in our budget. Wow. And I, I had the phone here and I said to Gina, I said, Hey, it's John. This is the deal. She's like, what? Of, of course you need to say yes, because you love harvest. You love those guys and they're going to pay you. And that takes care of our budget. So of course, yes. Hey, John, we're in. And we flew out there in, in de- December uh, for the Christmas party. And I started in January. God always provides. You don't, you don't get to see around the corners or you don't get to see over the hills. But I know the guy who's already there. So how bad can it be? So is this and to like... Me, a- it's pleasurable. That stretching yeah, and that challenge yeah. and that growth is exciting and pleasurable. It, it, hey, Dave, you're in great shape. You didn't get there by working out with five pound weights. You got to stretch yourself. You got to add more. You got to you got to yeah. got to have some resistance. Otherwise, you don't grow. And I'm not satisfied with not growing. God wants to give us a lot more than what we settle for. That's right. That's right. And it's wild when that works out that way. And it's and it's the number, the exact number that you need. You know, I've told my kids this and some friends so many times that we take for granted time when we read through the Bible. Mm. Like what happens between, for instance, when Jacob has to work seven years to get his wife and he doesn't even get the right one. That happens (laughs) in the turn of a page, depending on the Bible you used. Yeah. (laughs) And you go, Oh, seven years. Yeah. It was nothing, but you don't deal with the, potential anxiety, the fear, you know, the not knowing. And that's where, to your point, you're trying to lean in to understand. It's the same idea, you know, when Joseph is in prison and he's sitting there and all of a sudden he gets to, you know, interpret some dreams. One guy gets killed. He sends the butler back up to Pharaoh, says, don't forget me. And he's thinking, I am out of here in a week. (laughs) And then he goes, maybe a month. And you read literally over a couple paragraphs. It's two years. Yeah. And you're going, I would have died over two years. You're like, what in the heck is happening? And how, you know, unfortunately we don't have enough there to think about the times that he was probably frustrated and mad and waiting. And to your point is, you know, we're waiting on God to do something to your point, Dave, there's action that has to happen in that, but God still has a major point to that because even going back to selling your house, I'm sure Steve, you're trying to think about which is the worst pain I want to deal with. <laughs> the pain of embarrass cultural embarrassment or the pain of having a huge upside down budget and having financial stress every month. Yep. And then you got to pick. Or I would say like in the deepest valley of whatever that strategic scenario looks like of what could be the worst case scenario. I think Steve goes, look how we can exercise our faith and where God can show up and look at the pleasure in that. Who cares about what we have to go through? God's going to shine. And I don't know how. I don't care. I've done this a million times. My faith muscle's huge. Get out of my way. I, I, did this one, I did this once in the Sunday school class that I used to teach at the church we were at, uh, Bailey Baptist Church. It was an 830 Sunday school class. We started with six. And by the time I stopped teaching, we had 90 people in there. It was nuts. Oh, my God. <clears throat> but I, I said, I, you know, it, God says, don't worry about that. I'll supply all your needs, right? Let's test that. Let, let's, let's test that. And then I was doing this in class. I said, okay, let, let's assume that our house burns down. We lose everything. Okay. We lose everything. Scenario A, uh, how many of you would take us in for a little while? Who would help us get groceries? Who would buy us clothes? Who would, who would help us just get, get back on our feet? Uh, and, and then, and then we'll figure it out. But in the meantime, we lost everything. Who's going to help us. And don't answer the question because it, it's the right spiritual answer. I only answer if you actually would, because I'm going to take a picture of all you guys. So if that ever happens, I'm going to call on you uh, right. to help out my family. And so <laughs> raise your hand. And so all these hands go up and I see, boom, look right there. God already provided for all my needs and my wife's needs and my kids needs. I don't need to worry about it. That's scenario a let's, let's go to scenario B the second scenario. I drive my business into the ground. I make stupid decisions. I screw up. I, I completely train wreck the whole thing. And uh, it all blows up in my face. It's 100% my fault. And, and we're in trouble. And we're homeless. 
who will help us for a little while now? Now it's not like an act of God. I did it. I blew it all up. <clears throat> so your charity is going to have to be matched by your grace. So who's willing to do that? And it's my fault. I totally screwed the whole thing up. I screwed the pooch. <laughs> it's, it's, it's my fault. Who's going to help me? And just about as many hands went up. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, boom, there you go. At least for me as a Christian in the body of Christ, I know even if I screw it up because my brothers and sisters know enough about grace that God's got me, even when it's my fault. And so to your point, Dave, what do I have to lose? And, and I think God wants us to be a little bit more like Crocodile Dundee from back in the 80s and 90s. Life should be a little bit more of a walkabout. I'm just going to go see what the Lord has out there. And when I see an opportunity and, it, and, and I can make a good case for it biblically, it's a good thing. It's a God-honoring thing. It's a, it's a noble calling. And I'm going to do it. And we'll see what God does with my faithfulness. Fruitfulness is his deal. I try to stay on my side of the equation. This is my 23rd year of marketing, running this business. Um, wow. And, you know, our vertical has always been Jesus. And so I've, I have brought on every single account that we currently have. Like I'm the one that talks to them pretty much, or they don't, they don't come on the agency without vetting through me. And I get probably one to two, maybe three leads from around the world, specifically wanting to do a daily devotional or a book from a pastor. In fact, just yesterday I was on a call um, and the guy says, hey, I want to market my book. And I say, he said, he said, what kind of concern should I have? And I said, well, um, books are really hard. It's a very, very difficult space. You know, you almost have to have like an audience before you even bring a book to market. But if you don't have an audience, it's tough. In fact, you're going to get slaughtered mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, and financially. And if you look, <laughs> sign me up. <laughs> if you look at all that, you, you are the bear of great news. <laughs> That's Your what he said. Actually, is amazing to me. That's like, what he said. He said the book, is... set it on fire. <laughs> <laughs> I said, if all that aligns, okay, and you still feel the calling to go do this, <laughs> then let's go do it. But just to know that you're going to have to have a faith muscle. You're going to have to step out. This is going to be painful. And I, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm a Debbie downer here, but the rea this is the reality of you've got to step out on faith, man. You've got to talk vision. You've got to get in front of people. You've got to build an audience. You've got to spend some money. You can't just, you know, you, you got to take some action, man. Mm -hmm. You got to get that messaging down and you got to take action. And that's where I really just am. So like, Steve, I just, I just, I just feel like you're just a, such a big mentor. I don't think you realize this of, of just watching you move around the faith-based market and finding your vision and your passion and your purpose and just going to do it and kicking butt. And that's been very inspirational to me. Mm. And I think that people are watching this need to kind of, you know, watch what you've done. And, and that faith muscle is so, faith muscle is so big and it's so tangible in your eyes, in your heart and in your spirit that when it's God's calling, you just go do it, man. I'm just, just so excited to be part of your life and your journey and watching well, you that. Well, that's very kind of you to say and, and very humbling. And the other thing is, I like at this uh, homeschool convention I was just at in South Carolina, and I get a little amped up when, when I'm communicating <laughs> with people. And at one point I stopped and I said, do I seem desperate to you guys? And this is a trick question. I've been doing this for years. I'm like, do I, do I seem desperate? And one guy in the back says, you're not desperate. I just think you're passionate. Right. There you go. There's, there's, I'm desperate for my fellow man, mm. but I'm passionate about God's call about the gifting he's given me the opportunities that are out there. And, and I don't want anybody to assume that I have the Midas touch because I don't, and I've screwed up as many things as I've succeeded at. And some things I feel like are totally mediocre and, and I'm always my harshest critic and uh, I'm, I struggle sometimes with the way I view myself. Psalm 51, David's uh, prayer of repentance. My sin is ever before me. But God has proven himself so much bigger than my doubt and my failure mm -hmm. and my pain that I'm like, who, who really, who am I going to 
who, who am I going to put my chips on? Am I going to put my chips on the table on Steve Noble or am I going to put them on God? And that's why I said, no matter, even if it all blows up, <clears throat> I know God's going to get me to a better place than I was before. There's, there's only an upside there. Even through the perceived pain, there's an upside. And one day I'm out of here and I get eternal rewards for my faithfulness. I, I used to get all worked up about the numbers, Dave, like at Harvest Crusades or whatever. And I'm like, God doesn't call me to be, to develop fruit. He calls me to be faithful. Be faithful, Steve. Be faithful, David. Be faithful, Dave. When I, when I show you something, I invite you into it. Just be faithful. Put, put all yourself on the table and let me deal with the results. And I'm like, that's a pretty good job description where I get eternal benefits just for giving my all. And, and he's actually not checking the performance numbers. He wants me to be faithful. And, and that's it. It's really pretty simple. And that's a killer job. Is it not? <laughs> Absolutely, it is. For sure. So, you know, Dave, you kind of hit wow. on a second ago, but to Steve, what I would ask you is ultimately, give us a sneak peek. What is, what is the big, big vision you have for Noble University? Give us yeah. an idea what that looks like. Uh, one of my, we've been doing some vision stuff with my board uh, the last couple months. And one of the guys that does consulting, business consulting uh, for a living, he's like, where do you see this in, in 10 years? Like, where do you see this in 10 years? And I said, uh, 10,000 students a year in 10 years and other teachers who are passionate about important topics. I only want to add teachers and topics to Noble U that are going to equip young Christians to engage the culture, to try to strengthen their faith, their ability to think rightly. Uh, and teach them things that are going to actually impact how they live in the future. So we're not going to expand it into a full high school. But like I've got a 25-year teacher right now who's working on a, a one-semester course on media literacy. Meaning, how do you filter through all the stuff coming at you through media so that you actually know what you're looking for? And how do you find the truth? And how do you discern and all that garbage? And so I just want to continue to add other, other teachers that are passionate. I don't want any teachers under the age of 40. Because if you're under 40, you haven't lived enough, you don't have enough wisdom. I want people in the second half of their life who, who really feel a calling to pay back and to give back, especially to the next generation. Our founding fathers used the word posterity a lot, uh, the people coming behind us. And so that's the vision to continue to add classes. I'll teach as long as, as God allows me to teach. The beautiful thing about Noble U is it doesn't have to have anything to do with my last name. I could be dead and gone and it could carry forward because Noble is just a great adjective. Mm -hmm. And to be a Noble U, what does that mean? Well, we'll go to the Bible and, and pretty much Romans chapter 12 on that one. Uh, but that, that's the vision. I just want to reach and teach as many high school uh, students who claim to be Christians as I can. To, to help them be equipped to live a life of truth as well as effectiveness and grace. You really more, the culture war approach to America doesn't work anymore. You got to let that go. And now you've got to be shrewd as a viper and gentle as a dove. And God has brought me down a road where 20 years ago, I was just all truth and no grace. I was just a viper. <laughs> I wasn't, I didn't have the dove. <laughs> Doves were just wimps. And, but today I've God brought me to a great balance. And, and I show the students uh, what that looks like in class and then applying a biblical worldview to all these topics and go, this is a work, this is a workable, comprehensive biblical worldview. It's like having the secret decoder ring. Or if you go to the national treasure movie, it's like finding Thomas Jefferson's glasses when you got all three lenses come together and then boom, there it is. You can see the hidden map on the back of the declaration of independence. That's the beauty of a Christian worldview. Now you can start making sense of this psycho world that we're in, but never losing hope. And so there's so much there that I just, love pouring this stuff out into these young people and uh they respond I, I sit there and watch it happen with my eyes in class where they're starting to understand they're starting to talk about being woke they're they're really awakening to the value of a christian perspective of a christian worldview and and teaching them how to be conversant in topics and be smart in topics that the world around them is talking about it's a, they're all a bunch of great on-ramps to try to reach people with the gospel of Christ, ultimately through U.S. history or world history, civics, whatever. They're all just tools. Uh, and, and plus, you can disciple and you can build a worldview and you can teach a gospel heart all at the same time, which I just call teaching in 3D. Uh, and I'll reach as many and teach as many as, as God allows me to. And I'll, I'd like to keep teaching until he kills me. Hopefully, that's not tomorrow. But that's the plan. <clears throat> and where that goes, I don't know. The ultimate fruit of that's not my problem. That's God's deal. That's not mine. My deal is faithfulness. I'm going to put everything into it that I can 
as long as I can for the glory of God. And that's the end of it. Steve, what's your biggest concern, not in your abilities to communicate this, because obviously you're very well skilled and you know what you're talking about. What's your concern with this next generation coming up? Uh, apathy. Apathy and fear. I think the opposite of love is not hate. I think it's apathy. And I think fear of man, it, they're growing up in a digital age where they're so worried about the perception of themselves, likes, follows, how many views on my video, my TikTok page, whatever. That I think when the culture becomes more increasingly more anti-Christian, you tend to hide. You go into the catacombs and, and you, you, you disengage and you can't do that. Uh, yes, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? He, he gives you one complex answer in two sentences. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. You can't love your neighbor as yourself if you don't engage. So, so my concern with them is, is ignorance because they live in a media-saturated world and they're not learning much. I'm rarely impressed by my own students when they first come in the classroom. Uh, and then that ignorance, they get fearful and that leads to apathy. So you just pull back. Uh, and we mm -hmm. have a lot of kids walking away from the faith, which isn't totally unnatural when you get out of your parents' house, you're going to stray and goof around and try to get your feet on the ground. <clears throat> so I, the, the Barna statistics, Barna makes money with bad news. So you got to remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that's it. Just fear and apathy. And they, and they start to go, well, the end of the Christian way of life doesn't really, you know, I don't know that it works. Yes, it does, but they have to be led there and taught. Um, so that's it. Fear and apathy. Over the last uh, last, I have two more questions and we'll, we'll shut it down. And Dave, if you want to add the final comment here, but in the last three weeks, this is kind of hot news here. Um, I've really, um, been hit. Like I said, we get a lot of leads from around the world and like, this is something that's very strong that has happened in the last probably month or so. Mm -hmm. I've had three or four leads of different people who had a vision from God that called into the agency and said, we have a discipleship problem and I want to, I want to fix it. And like, I feel like, you know, after two calls, it may be a coincidence, but three, it's like something's happening out there with discipleship. Like either it's dead, it's not working. People don't care. What's say you, Steve? Uh, people don't do it. Everybody's looking for the McDonald's <clears throat> fix. Can I just drive through? I'll write the right book. And then everybody's going to follow the right discipleship program. Uh, I'm going to go with the program from 2000 years ago. And you just do life with people. Yeah. And so for me, discipling <clears throat> these students in class every week, week in, week out, I get 32 weeks with them in uh, an hour and 15 to an hour and 25 minutes each week. So God gives me 35 hours to impact every single one of these 260 students. What an opportunity. So my discipleship of them happens like it is yeah. when we're just sitting here talking. A discipleship is, is a problem because we don't do it. We outsource it to a YouTuber, to a youth pastor, to a book or a program. And discipleship is just life on life. You got to walk with people and do life with them. But we're not doing that. We we're outsource everything because we're yes. lazy and looking for a home run. No, you so, got to actually do the work. Yeah, I would, I, and and I and I would add something to that, Steve. Too just pragmatically. So, Dave, when when you look at a church, you look at their senior pastor. <clears throat> every senior pastor bends to one side or the other, either evangelism or discipleship. There's no senior pastor out there that hits that ball right down the middle and goes, I'm both. So when you look at it from a church standpoint, your first question to the senior pastor is, what are you really? Don't just tell me what you think the right answer, Sunday school, quote unquote answer is. What are you? And a lot of churches that struggle on the discipleship side is because your pastor leans on the, on the evangelism side, which is okay. But what that means then is you've got to have an executive pastor. You have to have other leaders in your church that are, have a white hot passion for discipleship. You can then trust and empower them to be able to do that. Not where you've got to hold on to the reins as Mr. Senior Pastor and it's, or Mrs. Senior Pastor and say, I'm not going to let anybody make a decision. No, it's where you're like, okay, the gifting is there. Let's create and do something to Steve's point. That's life on life. That's repetitive. That's in your life rhythm all of those things. But the problem we run into is if you dig a little bit deeper with a lot of these clients, what you're probably going to find is you're talking to a pastor who is white hot about evangelism and they don't have time to your point, Steve, I don't have time. Just get a program, get a book, watch, watch the video on YouTube. You know, this church put out a good one. That church put out a good one. 
and just put the sucker in and push play and then discipleship happens and that's not how it works <laughs> nope. you've got you've got to be able to balance out your staff you got to be able to put in some good passionate people that are there and then you got to let them run a little bit so i think there's a pragmatic side to that too well <laughs> let me just throw this bomb <laughs> uh the church the local church the church universal its primary purpose the church itself is to serve the church. It's to build up the flock. It's not evangelization. Yep. To equip the saints Hello. to do the ministry of the church, e- right, Steve? Evangelism exactly happens out there. We yep. do that out there. Now, occasionally people come to the church that aren't believers. Okay, fine. Uh, but the primary responsibility of the church and the pastor and the staff is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. That's right. You you go out there, that's where evangelization happens. And then when as people get saved, they come in here and then they get fed and we disciple them. So any pastor that says I'm all evangelism and no pa- and and not so much discipleship, I'm like, then get out of the church. Yep. Go mm-hmm. out there and be an evangelist, but don't That's lead a right. church. Yep. The church is for discipleship. Out there is for evangelization. So yep. I have a problem with that model in the first place. Yep. I would agree with you 100 percent And so does the Bible. The Bible's got a problem with that. <laughs> yep. Exactly. But there are so many people. That are in that senior role, but that's where they yeah. are, and then they make excuses for why it doesn't happen. So, tough conversations for sure. Tough conversations for sure. Super fun to be on the podcast with you, Steve. Thanks for taking the time to do this. I just my I pleasure. Leave the, I, I want to leave no the pain. audience. It was just pleasure. <laughs> I love it. I I think out of everything we talked about, there's lots of different nuggets for. But for me, God is bigger than my doubt. That Amen. what a powerful statement, man! You you've just, you've just lived that right there. Thank hey, you. I, you you go. Some kid is is being bullied, right? It's a school, but if all of a sudden he goes to school on Monday, and Conor McGregor, whatever that guy's name is, little whack job, yeah. or or Mike Tyson, or now what is it? Who's that guy's brother? Jake Paul. Yes. One of those guys goes with you, and you're walking into school. You're like, go ahead. Bring it because of who's with me. Yeah. Hey, man, I just know who's with me. I love that. That's it. That is That's so deep. good. I know who's with no. me. Yeah, I mean, Dave, the only thing the only thing I would add, I think at this point, too, is for everybody listening is, you know, you can get a lot of anxiety around trying to live a life of perfection. Mm. And one of the things we talked about was living a life of faithfulness. And if you look at the if you look at them both definitively, they're very different ideas. And, you know, faithfulness is, is consistency and it's your heart and your love for not yourself, for what are you living for? And I think that's a big one to think about is, as you have to pursue at times pain and deal with pain, consider your faithfulness in the process. So I think that's really good. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, you bet. All right. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks for joining in again. Appreciate you. Amen. Thanks. See ya. All right, guys. Thanks.